Okay, we're going to resume with our lecture on skeletal muscle contraction. At our first lecture, I talked about the three different major muscle types, which would be uh, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. <clears throat> now I'm going to discuss how skeletal muscle contracts. So this will just be a quick recap of what the anatomy of skeletal muscle looks like, and then we'll get into how the contraction occur. And so over here you can see our skeletal muscle being that attaches to skeletons through tendon. So there's lots of connective tissue around muscles. And each um, one of these muscle fibers is a um, you know surrounded by more connective tissue and then we get a muscle fiber, an individual muscle fiber. And this is a cell. So you may, of course, think of your generalized cell with one nucleus, but skeletal muscles have hundreds of nuclei, so obviously more than one nucleus, in fact, up to 100. <clears throat> and so these cells are rather long and skinny, of course, and have a lot of nuclei. And so the cell membrane um, is often known as the sacral, sacral lemma. You know, it's called plasma membrane in this um, diagram. It's also known as the sacrolemma. And then the endoplasmic reticulum is known as the sacroplasmic reticulum, which, as you might recall, stores calcium. And then <clears throat> the actual contractile units of skeleton muscle, skeleton muscle is the sacromeres, which is found in these myofibrils, which is loaded with these myofibrils. And so there's proteins called myosin, which is, in this picture, looks like red. And blue is our actin. And then this is all different proteins. We've got Z lines. And so it would look kind of like a cross section. You'd see a sausage and you'd see these different, you know, just describe it that way, piece of meat. You can see a tube. And then if you cut it in half, you can see there's this three-dimensional look where you have your red and your blue and the blue would represent the actin. So you'd have, if you're looking at this way, you have your red um, myosin, and then you have actin going all the way around it. Or, but in this picture, it looks a little bit more linear, where if you look at the bottom portion, you'll see the myosin, and then the thin actin that's surrounding it. Obviously, there's a lot of mitochondria associated with skeletal muscles because of the high ATP need to help the muscle contract. And so we're gonna start talking in depth about how does the muscle actually contract. Of course, you should also remember that muscles have, when they have this nucleus, what does the nucleus do? And obviously, it holds the DNA, and then that DNA can be transcribed to make um, trans messenger RNA and then ultimately translated into protein. So muscle fibers are huge in the amount of protein they need. And that's why you have so many nuclei. When you work out, you actually can produce more nuclei. And this helps lead to the concept of muscle memory, where if you work out, you get stronger. And then if you stop, while your muscles may shrink, when you return to working out, they can actually increase and grow faster because you've built up the extra nuclei from the previous exercise from years ago or whatever. You may have had that athletic moment. So anyway, we're going to start talking and looking at my cursor. We're going to start talking more and more about, um, in this lower part, what's happening in these myofibrils. So <clears throat> looking at this picture, you can again see the myofibrils, which represent the contractile units. If you look at the side over here, you, and hopefully you can see a cursor, if not, you'll see red dot and some blue circles. Well, that's what's represented as a cross section, which would look obviously looks like little dots, but are actually large, long protein strands, and this multitude of it, a lot more than what this picture might easily tell you. And so remember, muscles have dark and light uh, banding that we call striations. <laughs> and so 
the dark banding is due to the thick myosin and the light banding is due to um, um, just the empty spaces along with the actin, even though the actin obviously would darken it up a little bit. And so what I want you to see is that if you look at the bottom, you'll see this thing called a Z line and, the, and it goes to Z line. This is what we call a sarcomere. This is the contractile unit of muscles. And so you can also see it up here as well. And hopefully you can see the sarcomere, but you'll see that blue zigzag line with blue uh, lines coming off of it. That is the Z line. You can see it labeled the Z line as well. So from Z line to Z line, this is sarcomere. And so this goes up and down the muscle uh, bundles. And so each one of these is a contractile unit. They might move just a little bit and that's enough to cause your arm to bend and move and so forth. And I'll explain how that works um, as we can progress in this presentation. But essentially, if you look at the myosin, which is known as the myosin filament, you can see it easier or more labeled in the square below, that it has these little projections that we call globular heads. And you can liken the globular heads to little hands. That's how I like to think of it. And you can think of the actin like rope. And so if you have the imaginary rope here, the myosin heads will actually grab onto it and pull it. In fact, they'll pull the Z lines together. And this will make a little bit more sense when I show you an animation in a little while. So once all these different act, all these different myosin can grab onto the actin and pull towards the center, bringing the Z lines together. Now remember from the picture, we see this uh, cross section where we see the myosin in the middle and then there's actually actin all around. So that means the myosin is grabbing in all sorts of different directions. It's not just this linear model that we see at the bottom. And again, the darkened areas are due to the high amount of myosin. If you can look at the banding, you have your um, M band and you have your I band. And again, the I band's the lighter area. Oh, one other thing to note is one of the longest and largest proteins is this one known as Titan. And you can see it labeled on the square below. The Titan filament is a protein that goes from the Z line over to the other Z line and actually holds this myosin in the center. And by the name itself, it suggests it's a huge protein. And in fact, it is one of the largest proteins we know of. Of course, you should read these on the slides that I provided for you. So this is a more description of what the different uh, lines and so forth look like. So here we have our myosin. I don't know if you can see it in the cursor, but you'll see the myosin molecule. So we, we start at the upper left corner, you see the myosin strands, then we zoom in as if we had a microscope, and you see a myosin molecule with a globular head. The globular head is like the hands grabbing on to the actin, and the blue circles that we see here is the actin, and the actin is the rope that the globular heads will reach onto. Now, the other thing that's surrounding the um, actin is tropomyosin. Tropomyosin actually blocks the globular heads from reaching or the hands from grabbing the rope until it's time to do so. When it becomes time to do so is when the calcium actually attaches to the troponin, this green circle here. So calcium will leave the, the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum attached to the troponin, move the tropomyosin out of the way, and exposing the uh, binding sites on the actin. And so the globular myosin head will grab onto the actin and allow it to move. But when the muscle is relaxed and, not, and there's no contractions occurring, the tropomyosin is actually blocking the globular head. When you're flexing your muscle and picking up something light, a lot of the muscle fibers are still relaxed. You might only be contracting a few of them. It's only when you're 
put your muscles under a heavy load, do you contract all the possible fibers? So <clears throat> going down to this picture below the upper pictures, in case you don't see the cursor, you see our sarcomere, which is going from Z line to Z line, and you can see how the gobbler heads will grab on to the actin. We call this the sliding filament theory, where the sarcomeres come closer together and the filaments pass each other. So we have the myosin heads and the myosin grabbing onto the actin and actually causing the filaments to slide past each other. That's what we call it the sliding filament theory. This was discovered by Huxley and Huxley, <clears throat> the scientist who first proposed this idea. Here's another picture of skeletal muscle. You can see the sacrolemma is this cell membrane loaded with nuclei, and you can see the dark and light banding that we call styrations. And you can see this is loaded with these myofibrils. And when you actually um, you know, lift weights and you damage muscle, you increase some of this um, myofibrils and connective tissue is some of what we call hypertrophy, where you increase muscle size. Here's another picture showing you the ultrastructure of muscles. I showed this last time with you. Remember there is a cell membrane, we call it the sacrolemma, and we have T tubules that represent the cell membrane going internally inside the muscle cell. Another term for the T-tubules is transverse, tu transverse tubules. And it helps to bring the signal from the cell membrane internally into the cell. You can also see the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, this is for storing calcium and releasing it for the muscle contraction. Closely associated with the transverse tubules is this, on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this, this um, edge that's kind of blown up and, and kind of a little bit larger. That is known as the terminal cisterna, which um, is closely associated with the transverse, transverse tubules or T-tubules. And when a, your brain sends a signal down the nerves, to cause your muscles to contract, which we'll, I'll tell you and show you or in a diagram and animation a little bit later, the signal will reach the muscle membrane called the sacrolemma. And from there, the electrical chemical signal that we call action potentials, and we'll get into more of that in later classes, travels through these transverse tubules, ultimately causing the sacroplasmic reticulum to give up its calcium and allow for the calcium to attach to the troponin, move the tropomyosin out of the way and allow the myosin to grab onto the actin and allow muscle contraction. And then we'll get into this a little bit later or I'll we'll animate it in a moment. So here's another picture to help you to appreciate what's going on. Here we have our cell membrane and you can see it's going inside the cell through these two tubules. And right next to it is our sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then you can see the myosin. We call it the thick filaments as well. And here's our globular heads and our actin, which is the thin filaments. And so the myosin can grab on little blue knobs we call Globular heads can grab onto the thin filament and pull. Again, Huxley and Huxley proposed the idea of the sliding filament theory and explaining how myosin and actin slide past each other. And so, also associated with the myosin is a, mole a uh, molecule called ATPase which breaks down ATP. Remember that the mitochondria makes ATP. And then that I ATP can be transported over to your myosin heads, the globular heads, the hand, and attached 
and then the ATP is broken down by the ATPases located there to provide the energy needed for the muscle contraction. If you're not producing ATP, eventually you will not have muscle contractions and your body becomes rigid and we call that rigor mortis. And that'll become a little bit more apparent when I um, describe how the muscles contract in greater detail. So here is <clears throat> our myosin, again, and our globular head, and then we have our actin, and then you can see it's surrounded by the tropomyosin, and then the troponin sitting on top of the tropomyosin. So again, where calcium comes in and attaches to the troponin, and it'll move the tropomyosin out of the way and allow the globular heads to take over. So again, the sarcomere is the contractile unit of muscle fibers. And it goes from Z-line to Z-line, and we have our titan protein that's in green here going across it. And then if you look down below, you can see other artists' renditions of, um, you know, artists' illustrations of what the myosin looks like and the actin looks like. And here you can see the globular heads are Another term for the globular heads would be the myosin heads. And then there's a little hinge area that changes its conformation when ATP is attached. So the hand grabs on and moves because, and, the, and again, what's the rope? The actin is pulling. So the, the, uh, Z-line to Z-line is the sarcomere. Here's another image of it. You can see it's a circular shape. Now here is our first electron micrograph picture of a sarcomere. And you can see the Z-lines, which is the darkened area. The I-band, so it's a dark line straight down. There's two of them. And then you can see it's surrounded in what we call an I-band. Hopefully you can see the cursor. That's just a lightened area. And then you have your H um, zone, which is a little bit clearer, but the A band is dark. The A band is where most of the myosin is sitting. So again, these are lines going across. These lines are either actin or in the area that's really dark, it's myosin and actin. <clears throat> and so the Z lines will come closer because the myosin is pulling in this direction and pulling in this direction and the actin is moving across the myosin and we call that the sliding filament theory. Here's another picture depicting the myosin and the actin and its association. You can see that in the A band, we see, and this is on the right corner circle, we see, um, that's the darkest area, and that's due to having myosin and actin associated with it. It's a little bit less dark when we just have the M line or H zone, and it's obviously a lot lighter in the I band. Again, this is what's causing the formation of these styrations. The darker area is the A band, where it's primarily made up of myosin and actin while the I band is mostly just actin. And you can see that the titan protein goes all the way through the myosin. So this would be myosin in the middle that's blue. It's not showing you the globular heads in it, but that's where the myosin is associated. So this gives you this, the general gist. Again, ATPase is gonna be critical in the thick and thin filaments moving past each other. So you can look at these pictures here, but let's go ahead and move to the overall movement. Here's our globular heads, myosin heads, and our thin filaments. And so the thin filaments uh, is the actin. So this is just more pictures of what I described and I'd like for you to look at and think about. Okay, so here's the sliding filament theory. I hope this gives you a little bit better appreciation. You can see the Z line, and we're looking at the top picture upper right. And you can see the titan is the yellow protein, 
you have your myosin, and then you have your actinus, the blue in this particular case. Those little knobs that you see on the myosin will grab onto the actin and pull it across and they'll make the sarcomere shorten. And so if you look at the top picture, that is the before picture, and the bottom picture is the after picture when the, when the myosin brings the Z lines closer together. And again, this is just happening up and down each one of these muscle fibers, and that's just a little bit of movement is enough to get your arm to move. Now, what's amazing about this is all this happens within milliseconds. It's very, very fast. So a few milliseconds, the information travels down from your brain. A few more milliseconds, the information travels across the cell membrane of the muscle. And then within about 10 or within about 60 milliseconds, your muscles have contracted and relaxed. So it's a very, very fast process. And again, this is universal across most animals. So it's pretty amazing stuff to think about it. So what I'm teaching you here is the basics of how muscles work in all animals. That have them. Sponges are an example of an animal that doesn't have them. Now the top picture again is the before, the relaxed state. And in fact, if you started stretching your muscles, you would actually pull the Z lines apart a little bit more in addition to the other tissues and actually weaken your muscle contraction a little bit, which has been shown. Here is another picture of the sliding filament theory demonstrated by both a picture and an actual microscopic picture. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that the Z lines are pretty far apart and the M or the A band, and you'll see the I bands really long, if you look at this upper left picture, and then when the myosin heads grab onto the, onto, when the myosin heads grab onto the actin, it'll bring the Z lines closer together, actually making the I band considerably smaller. And that's because the sacromeres are coming together, and that is the muscle contraction. So biceps are contracting this way, and then your triceps contracted the other way. That's how muscles work, and that's why you need opposing muscles because muscles work by contraction. And when the other side, um, when my triceps are contracting, my biceps are relaxing. And again, it's marvelous to think all this is happening in milliseconds, um, so it's pretty incredible. So this is one of the most important uh, pictures that I really want you to spend some time thinking about it'll help you to answer exam questions. It's put in together in a comic book style. And so if you look at the top upper left picture, you can see that this is known as the rigor state. This is a state where the myosin head is attached to the actin. Now remember, there would be myosin all over the place. And it's at a 45 degree angle. And so it's rigidly holding on to the actin. This is also should remind you of rigor mortis. When your muscles are very stiff after passing away, that's due to the fact that ATP does not allow your muscles for the myosin to relax and let go of the rope. So the rigor state is what would happen during rigor mortis. And then eventually your muscles would soften up because of rotting. But if you're making ATP and you're lucky to be alive, the ATP will attach to the nucleotide binding site. Remember, ATP is a nucleotide because of andesin. Andesin is a nucleotide, but in this case has three phosphates associated with it, making it the primary fuel source of all animals, most life even. Andesin triphosphate. And so andesin triphosphate will attach to the nucleotide binding site and then if you look at slide two, you'll see that the hand, the globular head is let go, and now it's actually pivoting and going over to actin number two. ATP is providing some of the fuel for that. And when I say fuel, again, what's happening is a molecular change in the protein that's happening thanks to the bond binding of the ATP to the nucleotide binding site. And so, Anison triphosphate becomes anison diphosphate and a free phosphate. So moving from slide 
3 to slide 4, which is on the bottom left, the mycin head swings and then attaches to the binding site of actin number 2. And from there, um, we call this the relaxed state. But once the phosphate is released, we have our power stroke. So it comes over, grabs onto actin, and then the power stroke occurs. And that is in step five. And this is where the hinge takes place. And again, this is happening all over um, where the myosin is grabbing onto all sorts of bits of actin and doing this. After the power stroke has occurred, the myosin releases ADP, and then we're back to step one again, the rigor state, where it's holding on rigidly, and we wait for another ATP to come in. And there's ATP floating around, and of course gets used up from muscle contractions. So that is the sliding filament theory. Let me show you a quick animation on that, and then we'll come back and continue on the slides. Okay, so now we're gonna see an animation that helps to illustrate this and place it together, hopefully a little bit better for you. So the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, see what this is happening. So we're going to look at this video that shows you sliding filament theory, and then I'm going to discuss it as it goes through. So the first thing, of course, we're looking at is skeletal muscle fibers. We're seeing styrations. Um, we're seeing nerves that are coming to it. And now we're going to zoom in and take a look at the myofibrils. We move our bodies by contracting skeletal muscle. While the results of this action are plain to see, the mechanism behind the action is not. Contraction so if you look at this picture here, or this video animation here, and hopefully you can see my cursor. If not, you're looking at the dark blue and the light blue. The dark blue is our Z line. And that represents, uh, holds the actin in place. And we have it over here on the right side as well. So again, remember the sarcomere is going from the, the dark blue to the dark blue. And then you got the actin, which is the light blue strands or filaments, the thin filaments is what we call it. And then you have the dark red in the center, which is our Myosin filaments or thick filaments that have the globular heads and the myosin or the myosin heads is another word to refer, to refer to it. And now you're going to see how it's like hands pulling the um, thin filaments across it. Skeletal muscle tissue occurs when actin and myosin myofilaments slide past one another, causing the sarcomere to shorten. So you can see how it's beginning to shorten, and it's these globular heads are all over the place grabbing onto it. It is important to note that the individual myofilaments do not change length Contracting. themselves, but instead overlap each other to shorten the sarcomere. And you can see how, remember this area here on the left, we've got the Z line, and then we have the thin filaments. And so that is our I band that's lighter, and then it gets smaller because the we're just referring to the amount of light to darkness. And so when the myosin and the actin begin to overlap each other, it, the, the darkened area gets larger while the relative to the lighter area. Moving in for a closer look, we can see the details. You can see how it goes, in, it's all over the place in different direction, the globular heads. Details of how this occurs. The molecules you see here are myosin, which at rest has both adenine diphosphate and phosphate molecules attached to So anyway, here's our, if you again look at the myosin, the myosin head, you'll see that the ATP, which in this case is now shown as ADP, allows the uh, myosin heads to grab onto the um, actin. If you look at the actin, you also see the troponin and tropomyosin. 
the blue circles are the actin and the blue line is the um, tropomyosin and the green is the troponin. The individual myosin heads, actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. When we decide to move, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So again, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is holding the calcium. That is released thanks to an action potential that travels down from your nerves to the cell membrane of the muscle down the T-tubules and then causes, and you'll see that in another diagram, causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. The calcium will attach to the troponin, troponin, and that'll move the tropomyosin out of the way and allow the myosin heads or the globular heads to grab onto the actin. It does so by opening up the binding sites on the actin. And again, a binding site is a molecular spot where it can grab onto. These molecules bind with their troponin molecules. This causes the tropomyosin molecules to move, revealing myosin attachment sites on the actin myofilaments. The single phosphate attached to the myosin heads gets released as the heads move to connect with the attachment sites on the actin. The resulting formation is called a cross bridge. The remaining so adenine... Again, when the myosin heads grab onto the binding sites of the actin, we call that a cross bridge. And then it's going to be just have and again that initial holding state is called the rigor state, as you remember from the comic book strip. And then as the ATP comes in, we move it down, it shifts from one actin to another actin, and then there's a power stroke when we um, release the phosphate. The diphosphate molecule is then expended in what is called a power stroke when the myosin heads pull the actin inward. Once the adenine diphosphate attachment is spent, adenine triphosphate molecules attach themselves to the myosin heads. These molecules trigger the release of the myosin heads from the actin attachment sites and are immediately broken down into adenine diphosphate and a single phosphate as the heads move back into their resting position. This is called the recovery stroke. If calcium is still present, the cycle will repeat again, and the sarcomere will continue to shorten until the calcium ions are transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the muscle relaxes. It's going to call the overall image um, sliding filament. All right, so let's look at another quick uh, animation of this. So obviously we have our actin or thin filaments or myosin filaments. The myosin filaments are going to grab onto the actin and be thanks, thanks to ATP, we're going to bring those Z lines together. So we're going to shorten the sarcomere. Do you, do you all recall what calcium attaches to? That's right, troponin, troponin and that'll move the tropomyosin out of the way, allowing for the active sites on the actin to be available for the myosin heads to form the cross bridge, as you recall. <laughs> that overall image, the sliding filament theory, you can see that the sarcomeres are <laughs> That's relaxation. So the green is the, in this particular picture, is the troponin. And that's what the calcium is going to attach to and move the tropomyosin out of the way so that the globular heads or the myosin heads can grab onto the actin. And again, myosin head and globular head is analogous to each other, the same thing I'm talking about. <laughs>
the active sites on the active <laughs>
excitation contraction coupling, how does, in, in some detail, how does the nerve impulse come down the axon to the axon terminal and cause the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum that ultimately is joined in with this, this contraction here. So thanks again and take care. And eventually we will have an open online office hours for the class that may have questions in regards to these diagrams and my lecture. Take care.